Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to begin by correcting the record. I'm very proud to be here with my two locals from Camden, New Jersey. I'm going to be seeing them. Please, guys, I'm going to be seeing you uh, later this week during your visit. Harold talked about the crisis in public safety we have in our city that is very much like the crises in public safety that you're probably facing in yours. We have a long way to go to get out of this problem. Our goal is to bring everybody back and keep them safe once they get back. We were able to take a giant step forward because of the involvement of your international president. He was available 24-7. He got into the weeds of the issue. He spoke for the members of those two locals, and he spoke for me. So I just want to publicly, Harold, thank you for all that you did to help bring those guys back in Camden, New Jersey. Thank you so very, very much. Wouldn't happen without you. On the way over, I was thinking about these moments we have in our lives that are where were you moments. I remember uh, on September 11, 2001, I was a couple of miles from here getting off what was then called the Metroliner when all hell was breaking loose in New York City and a few miles away at the Pentagon and soon in Pennsylvania. And I remember how frightened we all were. I had a where were you moment my mother-in-law had had a stroke around Labor Day of 2005, and I spent most of the weekend in the hospital with her in her room keeping an eye on her. I was a little sleep deprived, and as I watched the televised accounts of what was happening in New Orleans in the wake of Katrina, I couldn't believe what I was seeing, and I didn't think it was possible that Americans could be left behind and abandoned to die the way they were there. And frankly, I had another one of those where were you moments when I woke up this morning and heard that the Prime Minister of Japan had told anyone who lives within like a 20 mile radius of a nuclear power plant to either shut their windows, don't go outside, or get out as quickly as they could. Now I know where you were in those moments. And I know where you would be if you were in Japan today. And I know where you will be when, God forbid, the next crisis like that happens in America. You will be responding. You won't ask, what's in it for me? You won't keep a list of things to avoid because it's an inconvenient or unsafe place to go. When your country calls, you'll be there. You'll be walking up the steps of the World Trade Center when everybody else is running down them. You'll be in boats and helicopters and on foot to pull people out of the raging floodwaters to save their lives when people in this city forgot about them because they thought FEMA was doing such a good job. That guy didn't do a very good job, but you did in what happened in Katrina in those days. And if you were in Japan right now, you'd be risking your life and your family's future in order to save someone you never even met and don't even know. You are members of an extraordinary profession. You are an extraordinary group of Americans, and we are very proud of you. How tragic it is and how disconcerting it is that this extraordinary group of Americans is being denied a very ordinary right across this country. And that's the ordinary right to speak for yourself and bargain collectively. No American. Whether you are cleaning hotel rooms, building cars, refining oil, teaching kids, or fighting fires, no American has to be told what to do every day by their boss without the right to speak up and talk back in a reasonable way. It is extraordinary and it is disconcerting that the most extraordinary Americans are being denied this very ordinary right. Make no mistake about it, this is not about Wisconsin. We all live in Wisconsin now. Wisconsin was their test bed 
for a philosophy and a theory that they want to spread throughout this country. And Kevin and I saw the early tremors of this just this late fall and early winter when that federal collective bargaining bill that we all work so hard on was ready to be put in the final budget bill by the House. It was there. It was printed. It was there. I'm glad you're saying that because it was there. And the Senate, a handful of Republicans in the Senate, started to say, well, we just can't deal with this. We just can't live with this. And out it went. That was the early warning sign. That was the canary in the coal mine for what we're seeing today in Wisconsin. And it will spread across this country. And what's happening in Wisconsin, make no mistake about it, is not about balancing the budget and spending. You know and I know that the leaders of the unions in Wisconsin had made reasonable accommodations on every economic issue that Governor Walker put on the table. Wages, pensions, and health care. It wasn't about the economic issues. It's not even just about the fight for collective bargaining. What's happening in Wisconsin, what's spreading across this country, is a struggle between two very different visions of what America is and what kind of country we're going to be. Their vision of America is as long as the richest get whatever they want, as much as they want, whenever they want it, things will be just fine. Their philosophy is if the captain is well fed, the ship isn't hungry. We have a very different view of how America works. We believe that our economy doesn't prosper when the richest get as much as they want and decide to leave us the crumbs. We believe something different that I learned and listened to my oldest daughter. My oldest daughter, who is 18, is a rower. For those of you in the Philadelphia area, she rows on the Schuylkill River. She's rowed here on the Potomac and Washington, rowed all over our country in these crew boats. She went to a rowing camp when she was 11 or 12 years old. And a couple of the girls that were in the boat that she was put in weren't really working as hard as they should, so their boat wasn't doing very well. And she and a couple of other people went to the coach and said, we want to be put in a different boat. We don't think our boat's as competitive as it should be. The coach said to her, we don't change boats around here. You're with the other seven or six people that are in the boat with you, and either they learn how to row better or the boat doesn't move. That's our understanding of the way America works. We are all in the same boat. And if everybody doesn't have a chance to learn how to move that oar and have the nutrition and the training to move it, the boat doesn't move. President Kennedy famously said a number of years ago that a rising tide lifts all boats. That's what the union movement is about. That's what collective bargaining is about. And that's what America is about. The American economy is as strong as it is because we have a middle class. We're not just all rich and all poor. We have a middle class because we have unions. And the role of unions is collective bargaining, to speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. So understand, understand what this fight is about. It is not about the Wisconsin state budget, or the federal budget, or the budget of Ohio, or New Jersey, or Pennsylvania. It is not even a fight about collective bargaining. It's a fight about the future of the middle class in this country. Without unions, there'll be no middle class. Without collective bargaining, there'll be no unions. That's their objective. They understand, they don't understand, rather, something that Henry Ford understood very, very well decades ago. Henry Ford had the radical idea that you could only run a successful automobile company if the people building the cars made enough money to buy the cars. That was his vision of America all those years ago. Their vision of America is that every American worker should make enough money to buy a cell phone so they can receive dunning calls from India for bills that they haven't paid. That's their vision of this country, and they're wrong. So Governor Walker and the people like him all across this country, in the Senate, in the House here, 
are taking on the American way of life and fighting collective bargaining. This is the moment to do something about this. And I heard Howard Feynman's presentation, and I, I'm very impressed by the things that he had to say. And I frankly think his prediction is correct, that if there is not a new level of activism, the Walkers and the Kasichs and the Christies across this country will get what they want. It is up to us, it is up to you, to make sure that a different result happens. We need to say to Governor Walker, Governor Kasich, Governor Corbett, Governor Christie, the new governor in Florida, all of these people around the country, we need to say this. We believe that we should sit in a chair at the bargaining table and negotiate over our future. You believe we should go to our knees and beg you for our future. Well, let me say this to you, ladies and gentlemen. We do believe that we should be seated in a chair negotiating for our rights. And to those who say that we, will, we should be on our knees begging for our rights, we say this. We will be on our feet fighting for our rights across this country from this point on. My father dropped out of high school when he was 16 years old. He went to work as a boiler maker in a shipyard at the age of 20. During those years, he walked picket lines. He worked when it was five degrees in the winter and 95 degrees in the summer. His job was to crawl through the ship with a rag in his hand, cleaning up after the skilled laborers the electricians and the welders and the plumbers and pipe fitters. He worked there until the shipyard closed 41 years later. I grew up in a middle class home. We owned our home. We could buy a car every three years. My parents were able to pay for my college education because my father was in a union and because we had collective bargaining and he could earn enough to give those things to our family. The fight isn't about the Wisconsin state budget. The fight isn't about collective bargaining. It's about the American way of life. Our allies are not just police officers and teachers and social workers. They are everybody in this country who believes that no boss should have absolute power to tell you what to do and how to do it every single day of your work life. If you believe that you are enough of a man and enough of a woman to stand on your feet and speak for yourself, then this is your fight too. And when Americans march to those recall elections in Wisconsin, and they will, and when Americans march to the polls in the fall of 2012, we will reclaim our heritage of collective bargaining. We will reclaim the ascendancy of the American middle class. We will reclaim our country from those who would outsource it and sell it down the river for a quick buck. This country belongs to us and we're gonna to fight to get it back. Thank you very much for your time.